Welcome to the Reality Zone. I'm Ed Griffin. The program we are about to hear is taken from a recording of a presentation I made shortly after the publication of my book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, A Second Look at the Federal Reserve. And so here it is, as recorded live in Los Angeles, California, on November 18, 1994, my presentation on the Federal Reserve, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Thank you, Ernie, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Although, Ernie, I have to tell you, I think I like the short introduction better. <laughs> I guess there was a lot of traffic out there tonight, so we're getting started quite late. So I think I'll dispense with the usual jokes and all the preliminary remarks and jump right into the topic. And to try and give it some kind of historical perspective, I'd like to go back to the first century B.C., to a tiny kingdom called Phrygia. It was in Phrygia that there was a philosopher by the name of Epictetus. And it was Epictetus who said, Appearances are of four kinds. Things either are as they appear to be, or they neither are nor appear to be, or they are but do not appear to be, or they are not and yet appear to be. <laughs> There'll be a quiz on this. When I read that statement, I was sure that if Epictetus were alive today, he probably would be a Harvard professor of banking and economics. Because doesn't that sound like the kind of explanations that we get when you read through the Federal Reserve bulletins trying to tell you what the money aggregates are and that kind of thing? See, what Epictetus did was he took a relatively simple concept, but by the time he was through explaining it, we didn't have any idea what he was talking about. And this is so commonly done today by the experts. Nevertheless, I thought that his statement was pretty good because it provided us with a track to run on, kind of a theme for this presentation. Because you know, if there's anything in the world that is an appearance which is deceiving, it is the Federal Reserve System. In fact, it is one of those appearances of the fourth kind, which I'm sure you all remember, for those appearances which are not, and yet appear to be. So I'd like to use that as my theme for this topic and come back to it now and then during the progress of this presentation, if I remember to do that, and use it as a punctuation point here and there, and as a reminder of one of the most important aspects about the Federal Reserve System that there is to comprehend, and that is that there are a lot of deceptive appearances going on here. I think the best place to begin our story is with the creation of the Federal Reserve System itself. In fact, that takes us right to the reason for the title of the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the background of the story, you should know that Jekyll Island is a real island. It's off the coast of Georgia, and it was on that island in 1910 that the Federal Reserve System was conceived at a highly secret meeting that took place there. When things are done in secret, there's usually something to hide. And so I'd like to tell you that story and document it so that we can find out, first of all, that there was a meeting, that the Federal Reserve was indeed created there, that indeed there was a great deal of secrecy, and then we'll ask the question, why the secrecy? In 1910, Jekyll Island was completely owned by a small group of millionaires from New York. People such as J.P. Morgan, William Rockefeller, and their associates. This is where their families came to spend the winter months. It was a, a resort island. It was called the Jekyll Island Club. And on the island, there was a magnificent clubhouse, which was the center of their social activities. You can visit that clubhouse today, as a matter of fact. The island has since been purchased by the state of Georgia, and the clubhouse has been fully restored. It's a beautiful thing. And if you take the tour, you can walk down the corridor there, and there will be a room, and on the door to that room is a brass plaque, and it says, the Federal Reserve System was created in this room. So there's no secret about this part of it. It's a matter of public record. 
So this is how that story came to pass. It was November of that year, 1910, when Senator Nelson Aldridge sent his private railroad car to the New Jersey Railroad Station late in the evening. And there it was in readiness for the arrival of himself and six other men who were told to come under conditions of extreme secrecy. For example, they were told to come one at a time, not to dine with each other on the night of their departure. They were told to avoid arriving at the same time if they could. If they should happen to show up at the same time, they were instructed to pretend not to even know each other. They had to avoid newspaper reporters because they were well-known people, and newspaper reporters often frequented the railroad station. Had they been seen, questions would have been asked, especially if several of them had been seen together. One of the men carried a shotgun in a big black case so that if he had been asked where he was going, he was prepared to say that he was going on a duck hunting trip. The interesting thing about that is that we find out from his biography that this man never fired a gun in his life. He didn't even own one. He borrowed that shotgun just for the purpose of deception and camouflage. Even after they got on board this private railroad car, this pattern continued. They were instructed to use their first names only, to avoid last names. And a couple of them even abandoned their first names and chose code names. The reason for that was so that the servants on board the train would not know who these men were, because they were afraid if the servants had talked about it, word had leaked out in that fashion, then the purpose of the meeting could have been defeated. So absolute secrecy was essential all the way up and down the line. The private railroad car traveled for two nights and a day on a 1,000-mile journey to the south. And when they awoke the second morning, the car was on the siding at Brunswick, Georgia. There they took a ferry boat across the Inland Strait to Jekyll Island, then to the clubhouse. And for the next nine days, they sat around a table and they hammered out all of the important details of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. When they were done, they went back to New York. And for quite a few years after that, they denied that such a meeting ever took place. It wasn't until after the Federal Reserve System was firmly established that only then did they begin to talk openly about their meeting and what they accomplished there. Several of them wrote books on it, one of them wrote a magazine article, and they gave interviews to newspaper reporters. And so now, many years later, it's possible for us to go back to the public record and discover in minute detail exactly what happened on Jekyll Island in 1910. Now, who were these seven men? The first one I've already mentioned, Senator Nelson Aldridge. He was the fellow that owned the private railroad car. He was the Republican whip in the Senate. He was chairman of the National Monetary Commission, which was that special committee of Congress created to make a recommendation for legislative reform, banking reform, they called it. They wanted to reform banking in America because the American people were very concerned over the concentration of financial power into the hands of a small group of banks and investment firms in New York on Wall Street. That is what they called the money trust. That was a popular phrase. In fact, quite a few politicians had been successfully elected to office on their campaign promise to break the grip of the money trust. And that was one of the primary purposes of the National Monetary Commission, of which Senator Aldridge was chairman. He was also a business associate of J.P. Morgan. He was the father-in-law of John D. Rockefeller, Jr., which means, of course, that eventually he became the grandfather of Nelson Rockefeller, our former vice president. Remember, his full name was Nelson Aldridge Rockefeller, so he derived his middle name from his famous grandfather. The second man at the meeting was Abraham Piat Andrew, assistant secretary of the Treasury, Later, he became a congressman, and throughout his career, he was very important in banking circles. 
The third man there was Frank Vanderlip, president of the National City Bank of New York, the largest and most powerful of all the banks in America. Representing the financial interests of William Rockefeller and the international investment firm of Kuhn, Loeb and Company. Henry Davison was there. He was the senior partner of the J.P. Morgan Company. Charles Norton was there, president of the First National Bank of New York, another one of the giants. Also, there was Benjamin Strong, head of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. And incidentally, Benjamin Strong, three years later, when the Federal Reserve Act was finally passed, he became the first head of the Federal Reserve System. And finally, last but certainly not least, Paul Warburg was there, probably the most important man because of his knowledge of banking in Europe. Warburg was born in Germany, eventually became a naturalized American citizen. He was a partner in Kuhn Loeb and Company. But he was also a representative of the Rothschild banking dynasty in England and France, and throughout his whole banking career, he maintained close business liaison with his brother, Max Warburg, who was head of the Warburg Banking Consortium in Germany and the Netherlands. Paul Warburg was one of the wealthiest men in the world. But those are the seven men on Jekyll Island. And as incredible as it may seem, these men represented directly and indirectly approximately one-fourth of the wealth of the entire world in those days. And these are the men who sat around a table on Jekyll Island and created the Federal Reserve System. Does it arouse your curiosity? What's going on here? Now, for the skeptics who are here tonight, and I hope there are plenty, because if there aren't, I feel like the minister talking to the choir. I know there are always plenty of skeptics in my audiences, and that makes me feel very good. For the skeptics, you're probably wondering, did it really happen that way? Surely Griffin is exaggerating to make a point. Well, yes, it really happened that way, and I'd like to illustrate that by quoting for you just one piece of evidence here. This was taken from an article that was written by Frank Vanderlip himself that appeared in the Saturday Evening Post on February 9, 1935. Remember, Vanderlip was one of those at the meeting. And this is what he said. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together on the night of our departure. We were instructed to come one at a time and as unobtrusively as possible to the railroad terminal on the New Jersey littoral of the Hudson where Senator Aldridge's private car would be in readiness attached to the rear end of a train to the south. Once aboard the private car, we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. We addressed one another as Ben, Paul, Nelson, and Abe. Davison and I adopted even deeper disguises, abandoning our first names. On the theory that we were always right, he became Wilbur and I became Orville after those two aviation pioneers, the Wright brothers. The servants and train crew may have known the identities of one or two of us, but they did not know all. And it was the names of all printed together that would have made our mysterious journey significant in Washington, in Wall Street, even in London. Discovery we knew simply must not happen. Well, why? Why the secrecy? What's the big deal here? What's wrong with a group of bankers going to a private location and discussing banking or banking legislation? And the answer to that is provided by Vanderlip himself in the same article. He said, if it were to be exposed publicly that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. 
Why not? Because the purpose of the bill was to break the grip of the money trust. And ladies and gentlemen, it was written by the money trust. It's as simple as that. Had the public been aware of that fact, at the beginning we would never have had a Federal Reserve System. That was like asking the fox to build the hen house and install the security system. Absolute secrecy was essential for that reason. Congress would never have gone for it. The public would never have gone for it. So there we're face to face with a very important fact about the Federal Reserve System that is not generally known today. It certainly wasn't known then. And that it was formed in secrecy because there was deception at work here. But there's more to it than that, much, much more. Analyze for a moment the composition of that group. Doesn't it seem strange to you that these men were all together? Here we had the Morgans, the Rockefellers, Kuhn Loeb and Company, the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, all sitting around a table here coming to an agreement. Anything strange about that mixture? Well, ladies and gentlemen, these were competitors. What's going on here? Competitors sitting around, coming to an agreement. These were the giants in the investment field, which prior to this period were beating their heads against each other, blood all over the battlefields, fighting for dominance in the financial markets of the world, not only in New York, but Paris and London, everywhere. And they're coming to an agreement of some kind. This is an extremely important fact that is generally overlooked because it happened precisely at that point in American history, which is sometimes described in our history books as the period of the dawning of the cartel. This was that point in American history when a major ideological transition was taking place in business. Big businesses which had grown to great power and size and prosperity through the process of free enterprise competition, which is what made this nation great and allowed us to surpass the old world, now were in the throes of converting their ideology to that of monopoly, the avoidance of competition. It was John D. Rockefeller I who said it. He said, competition is a sin. And it became the destiny of these people to avoid competition now at all costs. Their life effort was to eliminate their competition if they could. If that was impossible, then to buy them out. If that was impossible, then to join with them in a shared monopoly, which is called a cartel. And this was the period of history when that transition was taking place very rapidly in all industries. For the 15-year period prior to the meeting on Jekyll Island, these financial groups of which we are speaking had increasingly come together in joint ventures rather than compete with each other. They found that it worked. They liked it. And the meeting on Jekyll Island was the culmination of that process. And now we come to the second astounding realization about the Federal Reserve System is that it is not a government operation at all. It is, in fact, a cartel. They created a banking cartel and legalized it by law, passed a law to make it legal and to enforce it. That is an amazing understanding of the Federal Reserve that you're not going to find taught in your textbooks. It is a cartel. But there is a third element that is even more important than those two for an understanding of what it's doing to us. And the third element that we must understand is that this cartel went into partnership with the government. Cartels often do that to enforce their cartel agreements, but in this case they did it in spades. Now, when a partnership is formed, there has to be a reason, there has to be a benefit for the partners, or they're not going to do it. So it's a legitimate area of inquiry for us to know and to ask, what's the payoff to these partners? Why did they do that? Why is the government in it? What does it get out of it? And then we'll ask and find out why the cartel is in it. 
and what it gets out of it. In order to see how that functions, we must examine now the mechanism by which the Federal Reserve System creates money. How does money come into being in our country? I call it the Mandrake Mechanism, named after that comic book character of the 40s, Mandrake the Magician. Before I go into this, I need to warn you folks about one thing. Don't try and make sense out of this, because it doesn't make sense. It's not supposed to make sense. Just remember that this is your good old-fashioned scam, and you'll be able to understand it pretty well. Furthermore, I want to tell you that I'm going to make this sound very simple because I'm stripping out of it all of the banker language and all of the accounting terminology, and I'll speak it as best I can in plain old English. But I can assure you, even though it may sound like it's ridiculously simple, I can assure you that every part of this is 100% accurate from a technical point of view. So this is how it works. It starts with the government side of the partnership. It starts, in fact, in Congress. Congress needs money, a lot of money, far more than its income. Taxes only make up a small percentage of what Congress spends. Well, how can they spend more than they take in in revenue? Here's how it works. Congress, let's say, needs a billion dollars for today's expenditures. So they go down to the Treasury and they ask for the money. And the Treasury official says, you guys have got to be kidding. We don't have any money here. You spent it all back in February or March. Everything we took in in taxes is gone. Not to worry, they say. Together, they walk further down the street to the Federal Reserve Building. Now, the Fed has been waiting for them because that's one of the reasons it was created. They walk in, and the officer at the Federal Reserve opens up his desk drawer, pulls out a big checkbook, and he writes a check to the United States Treasury for one billion dollars, and signs it and gives it to the Treasury official. Now, we need to ask a question at this juncture. Who put that billion dollars into the checking account at the Federal Reserve so that they could lend it or give it to the government? Where did that money come from? And the amazing answer is, there is no money. In fact, technically, there isn't even a checking account. There's just a checkbook. <laughs> and that billion dollars springs into being precisely at the instant that the officer signs the check. Now, if you and I were to do that, we would go to jail. But they can do it because Congress wants them to do it. This is, in fact, the payoff. This is the reason the government is in this partnership, because the government has instant, easy access to any amount of money at any time without having to go to the taxpayer and ask for it in the form of direct taxes. If they had to go to the taxpayer and say, well, we want to spend this, this, and this, and we're going to raise your taxes another $3,000 per family this year, they'd be voted out of office. Not a popular thing to do. They like the mandrake mechanism. But that's why the government is in it. But why is the banking cartel in it? To answer that question, we'll go back to that billion-dollar check and follow some of the money. The Treasury official takes the billion-dollar check and deposits it into the government's checking account, which is, of course, in a Federal Reserve Bank, so-called. And at that instant, the computers show that the government made a billion-dollar deposit, therefore it has a billion dollars in its account, therefore it can now write up to a billion dollars in government checks, which it starts to do. We'll follow just a $100 check that it writes to the postal worker that delivers our mail. He takes it now and puts it into his checking account in his personal commercial bank down the street. Now the money is finally out of the Federal Reserve Bank, so-called, out of the government side of this partnership, and it's finally into the banking side, commercial bank. 
$100 has been deposited, so the banker goes over to the loan window and opens it up, and he says, attention, everybody, we have money to loan. Somebody just deposited $100. We have money to loan. And this makes everyone joyous because that's one of the reasons they go to the bank, is to borrow money. It's nice to know there's money to loan. So they line up for the money. But they're a little concerned because it was only $100, but the banker says, don't worry, we can loan you up to $900 on that. How is that possible? How can the banks loan $900 when there's only $100 in deposit? Well, it works like this. The Federal Reserve System says that the banks must keep no less than 10% of their deposits in reserve. The bottom line is that the $100 that was deposited there is 10% of $1,000. Therefore, the bank can loan up to $900, which is the difference. Now, where did that money come from? The answer is the same. There was no money. That springs into being at precisely the point at which the loan is made. Now, let's analyze this. An important difference here between these two functions. The money that was created out of nothing and given to the government was spent by the government for its projects. On the other hand, the money that was created out of nothing for the banks, they didn't spend that for their projects. They loaned it to us for our projects. But they collect interest on that loan. So the bottom line is that they collect interest on nothing, which is not too shabby. This is why the banking cartel is in the partnership, because all of this becomes legal. Interest on nothing. What are the consequences of this? This money that is created out of nothing goes out into the economy, and these new dollars dilute the value of the old dollars that were already out there. It's like pouring water into the pot of soup. It dilutes the soup. When you pour all these new dollars into the economic pot, it dilutes the dollars that are there, and so prices start going up and up and up, and we have this phenomenon of inflation, which is the appearance of rising prices. I emphasize the word appearance because, in reality, prices do not rise. What's really happening is that the value of the dollar is going down. If we had a money which was based on gold or silver or anything else that had intrinsic, tangible value that they couldn't just create out of nothing, you would find that prices would remain stable over a long period of time. And to illustrate that point, it's interesting to know that if we had lived in ancient Rome, we would have been able, with a one-ounce gold coin, to buy a very fine toga, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of sandals. Well, today, what can we buy with a one-ounce gold coin? We can go into any men's store and buy a very fine suit, a handcrafted belt, and a pair of shoes. The real price of those items hasn't changed in thousands of years when expressed in terms of real money. But when expressed in terms of those paper things we carry around, Federal Reserve notes, we call them dollars, they're not, they're Federal Reserve notes, they buy less and less and less because there are more and more and more of them being pushed into the economic pot of soup. We're still not done with the analysis, so we lost some purchasing power. Where did it go? Did anybody get it? People don't ask the question, did somebody get my lost purchasing power? It's as though, well, it just evaporated. It went up into heaven or someplace. It's just gone. No. For every loser, there is a winner. 
Somebody got your lost purchasing power. Who? Let's track it. Those people who got the lost purchasing power were the ones who were right at the point where the new money was injected into the pot. Because they got their hands on it first, and at that point it had full value. But by the time they spent it and gave it to the next person, and then they spent it and it started moving out toward the edge of the pot, where most of us are, then it lost its value. But the ones up at the nozzles were the ones that had gained on our lost purchasing power. Who are they? Well, it's clear that the government is number one, isn't it? Because that first check, that billion-dollar check that we tracked, went to the government, number one. They got it first. What about the money created on the banking side of the partnership? Who got that first? Well, the borrowers, didn't they? The ones that lined up at that window. That was the nozzle. Now, this is something that we all recognize. In times of inflation, everybody says it's wise to borrow. Why? Because you borrow dollars, but you pay back in dimes. Inflation erodes that thing. You have contracts, and you pay back with money that has less and less value. So the poor guy that gets your payment at the end of the line has lost his purchasing power, but you gained it because you were smart enough to borrow in times of inflation. That's the way it works. That's one of the reasons they entice people into debt, because it's the smart thing to do. What they don't tell you, however, is that what you are gaining from this process, you are turning around and having to pay to the bank in the form of interest payments on that loan. Interest on nothing. The bank is actually capturing your gain through interest payments. Now, sometimes you have paper profits. Oh, look at the value of this real estate. Look at the value of this stock. People are paying more and more for it. But don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that economic conditions can change and these paper assets can contract as well as expand. And when the economy does contract, as usually it does, always does, then people are wiped out. They don't realize that the boom-bust cycles that we have had since the creation of this Federal Reserve mechanism is like a sawtooth. The economy expands slowly for long periods of time, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and people think, this is going to go on forever. And then, boom, it comes down, usually very quickly. A lot of people lose their assets. And then it starts again for another 20 or 30 or 40 years. Oh, it's a wonderful ride, and then, boom, it comes down. And every time it comes down, people lose their their investments. Notice, however, when you go to the bank and they give you something which costs them nothing to create, what do they want from you in return? Signature on the dotted line for your car, your house, all your assets, right? So if you can't make your payments of this nothing money, they get your marbles. They always win. In times of whether it's expansion or contraction, it doesn't make any difference. It was planned that way, carefully worked out. These people are scientists, ladies and gentlemen. This is the bottom line that those who gain your lost purchasing power are the two groups that comprise the partnership in the Federal Reserve System, the government and the banking cartel. Now, this process is a tax. I don't care what you call it, inflation, or what name you want to give to it, it is a tax. If there's anything you remember about this presentation this evening, I hope it is this, that inflation is a tax. This is why these two groups are in the partnership. On the government side, they are able to tax their citizens in any amount, unlimited amounts of money, without the people even knowing that they are, in fact, paying a tax. And on the banking side, they are able to collect perpetual interest on nothing. Well, let's go back to Jekyll Island. We have a lot to learn on that island back in those days, because all of what's happening today was germinated right there around that table for nine days. They had a particular problem, which was what to call this creature, 
You see, this partnership between government and banks was not new with the Federal Reserve System. It actually was conceived in Europe in the 16th century. And it was experimented and then finally perfected with the formation of the Bank of England in 1694. From that date forward, all of the governments of Europe had used this kind of a mechanism. Of course, they didn't call it the Mandrake mechanism like I do. They have another name for it, and that is a central bank. So, when it came time to bring the central bank mechanism to America, these fellows on Jekyll Island knew that's what they were doing, but they couldn't call it a central bank because Congress was already on record as saying they didn't want that because they thought that what we needed in this country was something that was unique for American, the American economy. And these men debated what to call it, and this was their strategy. They said, first, let's call it federal to make it sound like it's a government operation. Next, let's add the word reserve to make it seem like there are reserves somewhere. Next, let's add the word system. This was far more important than it seems today because, remember, the primary concern was this concentration of power in New York. So they had to convince the American people that they were creating a system of banks spread over the geography of the whole country. First they were going to have ten, then they said, no, that's not enough. We need twelve regional banks to diffuse this power or the appearance of diffusing it. Well, we realize today that what we got was not federal at all. There are no reserves anywhere. There's not a system in the sense of diffusion of power, and the Federal Reserve banks aren't even banks. So on all four words, we have appearances of the fourth kind. It was brilliant deception, and now the next step was to sell it to the public. The first draft of the Federal Reserve Act was called the Aldridge Bill because it was sponsored by Senator Aldridge and uh, Paul Warburg warned him against that. He said, Nelson, if you put your name on this bill, it's going to be voted down in Congress because you're so clearly identified with big business interests. And Warburg was right. Congress put thumbs down on it. The bill of the big bankers. Well, it was a minor setback. They took their bill. They scrambled the paragraphs around a little bit, took Aldridge's name off of it, and found a couple of Democrats to sponsor the bill. Now, this was different, because everybody knew that the Republicans represented big business. But they also knew that the Democrats, on the other hand, represented the common man, you know, the working man, the fellow on the assembly line, like Ted Kennedy. So they found a couple of millionaire Democrats to sponsor the bill. Carter Glass in the House and Senator Robert Owen, who was himself a very successful banker, sponsored the bill, and now it was the Glass-Owen bill. Next, Aldridge and Vanderlip began to give speeches and interviews to newspaper reporters condemning the bill that they had written. They said, this bill will ruin the banks. It'll be terrible for the nation. And of course, by the time that got into the newspapers and the average person read that, they were saying, golly, the, the big bankers don't like this bill very much. It must be pretty good. You know, you have to give these fellows credit. They weren't stupid. They didn't get to be where they were by being country bumpkins. They understood mass psychology, they understood politics, and they played their cards exceedingly well. Meanwhile, these same individuals were, out of their own pockets, financing so-called grassroots study clubs that were springing up all over the country, holding public meetings, printing and distributing pamphlets, extolling the virtues of the Federal Reserve Act. They gave huge amounts of money to some of our better-known universities in America. 
established new departments of economics, handpicked their own people to be the professors to chair those departments. And then those professors began to give speeches and write scholarly essays about how wonderful the Federal Reserve System was. And then at the insistence of Paul Warburg, they added a few excellent provisions to the bill, provisions which seriously restricted the ability of the Federal Reserve System to create money out of nothing. And Warburg's associates said to him, Paul, what are you doing? We don't want that in our bill. And his reply was classic. He said, relax, fellas, don't you get it? Our object is to get the bill passed. We can fix it up later. It was because of those provisions that they won over the support at long last of William Jennings Bryan, who was the head of the populist movement. He had opposed this bill from the beginning. But when he saw those excellent provisions in there, he said, oh, well, I guess now I can support this bill. And with his collapse of opposition, the road was now clear. And everybody was for, almost everyone, except a few lone voices, was for the Federal Reserve. And indeed, they did fix it up later. Since the Federal Reserve Bill was passed, it has been amended over a hundred times. And every one of those excellent provisions were long ago removed, and many more have been added, which greatly expanded the power and reach of the Federal Reserve System. And so, with this professional, brilliant strategy and deception, it is no surprise that eventually the public and Congress was solidly for the Federal Reserve System. And the bill was passed on December 22nd, 1913, and the creature from Jekyll Island finally moved in to Washington, D.C. I'd like to focus for a moment on what are the objectives of the Federal Reserve System, because you know, we're told that the purpose of the Fed is to stabilize the economy and to put an end to chaotic banking. One of the more popular textbooks used in our colleges and junior colleges today is a textbook on economics written by Paul Samuelson. And here's what he says. He says the Federal Reserve sprang from the panic of 1907 with its alarming epidemic of bank failures. The country was fed up once and for all with the anarchy of unstable private banking. Well, that's what he said, and that's what the students are learning. Let's not challenge that for the moment. Let's just take it at face value, because this is the official doctrine, isn't it? The purpose of the Fed is to stabilize the economy and to protect the people. That's why they're raising our interest rates right now. That's what Greenspan says. Why is he doing this? to help people, right? <laughs> to stabilize the economy so we won't have massive inflation. It's for you folks that he's doing this. See? That's what he says. And if you're trying to figure it out on the basis of these official pronouncements, you'll never get it. Let's just take this official pronouncement at face value for a moment and see how well it's doing. Let's give it a report card. Since the Federal Reserve was created, it has presided over the crashes of 1921 and 1929, the Great Depression of 29 through 39, recessions in the years 53, 57, 69, 75, and 81, a stock market Black Monday in 87. We all know that corporate debt is soaring, personal debt is greater than ever, both business and personal bankruptcies are at an all-time high, banks and savings and loan associations have failed in larger numbers than ever before, interest on the national debt is consuming half of our tax dollars, heavy industry has all been but replaced by overseas competitors, we're facing an international trade deficit for the first time in our history. 75% of downtown Los Angeles and other metropolitan areas is now owned by foreigners, and over half of the nation now officially is in a state of recession. 
Now, that's the report card of the Federal Reserve System after 80 years of stabilizing our economy. I don't think it's even controversial to say that it has failed to meet its stated objectives. The only controversial issue is, why has it failed? And my answer is, because those have never been its true objectives. What are its true objectives? Well, what are the objectives of any cartel? To enhance the profit margins of the members of the cartel and to stabilize their position in the market. If we hold that in mind, now we get a different picture folding before us. Now they're not failing at all. They're succeeding. There were three objectives that the bankers had, the ones on Jekyll Island. They had three objectives in 1910 through 1913 that they wanted the Federal Reserve System to accomplish for them, and they were very verbose on the topic. And here they are. They said, first, they wanted to stop the erosion of their power away from New York. That's right. Exactly the opposite of what the Federal Reserve System was supposed to accomplish. That's what they wanted. This is a good point to mention that when we talk about the cartel, I'm not talking about the small banks that are struggling for survival under the Federal Reserve System. Remember, John D. Rockefeller said competition is a sin. And one of the purposes of the cartel was to put a check on the competition from these new banks, keep them in their place, eliminate them if possible, and to do so through regulation setting up conditions that the big banks could afford to handle, but the small banks could not handle. So I'm not talking about your local banker now. I'm talking about the New York cartel. That was objective number one. Objective number two was to reverse the trend of what they call private capital formation. Now, that's banker language for a trend in which individuals or businesses use their own savings for something instead of going to the bank and borrowing money for it. At the turn of the century, there was a trend toward private capital formation in business particularly. Businesses were holding back a certain portion of their dividends each quarter, putting that money into a sinking fund, and then as the capital formed or as they saved more and more money, then they used their own savings to build a new factory or to launch a research and development project or whatever. And the banks were extremely concerned over this trend. They wanted to entice businesses back into the banks to borrow money. And they knew that the only way to do that is to lower interest rates. And you may say, well, why didn't they just lower interest rates? Because you're thinking in terms of today, not then. Today, it's easy if you're the Federal Reserve System to lower interest rates because they have the lever to move it either way, up or down, totally within their control. But in 1913, there was no lever because the money in those days was backed by gold and silver. And you can't hook a lever onto that kind of money. Under those conditions, interest rates are the result of the natural forces of supply and demand. People cannot control it. I mean, individuals or committees cannot control it. Millions of people interacting in freedom control it. Supply and demand. But it's not subject to political control. And they knew that the only way that they could get people into the banks is to artificially depress the natural interest rate. How do you do that? They said that the answer was through a flexible currency. They said what the nation needed was a flexible currency to meet the demands of industry. Well, what is a flexible currency? It's not this stuff that bends. You need a dictionary to understand some of these things. A flexible currency, ladies and gentlemen, is money made out of nothing. That's what that means. Now, you see, the trick is not too complicated. If you can create money out of nothing, you don't have to charge an awful lot of interest on it to show a profit. <laughs> so, with a flexible currency, they could lower the interest rates 
below the natural level, still make plenty of profit on it, and entice the businessmen back into the banks. So the goal was a flexible currency. That was objective number two. And objective number three was to pass on the inevitable losses of the banks, pass them on to the taxpayers in the name of protecting the people. Now, those are the true objectives of the Federal Reserve. Let's now issue another report card and see how well it did. Did it keep control with the larger banks in New York? And the answer is yes. We have big banks in the West and in the South, but they are nothing compared to these mega banks in New York, which stride the world with offices in Peking and Moscow and Africa everywhere. The big banks continue to dominate. It gets an A on its report card for retaining control in New York. What about reversing the trend toward private capital formation? Boy, did it ever. Interest rates have been pushed down over periods of time. They're so attractive that individuals and corporations thought they were crazy not to take advantage of those low interest rates. Why save your money? That's stupid. So they were all enticed into the banks because of a flexible currency. And then, of course, they get loaned up to the eyebrows and something happens in the economy and you can't service your debt anymore. You go bankrupt. Right now, there are many corporations just and individuals just hanging in there by the skin of their teeth because they're trying to service their debt. And it's an amazing fact that many of these large corporations are now sending more money every quarter to the banks as interest payments than they send to the stockholders as dividends. Just think about that. The banks who made the money out of nothing are making more money out of large segments of our industry than the people who work for their money, save their money, invested their money, risked their money to purchase ownership shares in those corporations. And the Federal Reserve System gets an A on its report card because, indeed, with flexible currency, it reversed the trend toward private capital formation. Were they able to pass along their losses to the taxpayer in the name of protecting the people? Maybe you missed that part of it, but it's called bailout. The game called bailout it is played something like this. Whenever one of the large banks gets into trouble because someone it has loaned money to, either a big corporation or a third world country, can no longer pay its debt. So the bank is in trouble. It goes to Congress and it carefully explains to Congress that it must bail out that corporation or that third world country because otherwise it's going to hurt the people of America. If that venerable corporation is allowed to fold, look at how many thousands of jobs will be lost. People will be put on welfare. They'll be out of work, and that'll hurt the people. If that country down in South America cannot pay its loan, Uncle Sam better pay it for him, because otherwise the venerable bank in New York will have to write the loan off of its books, and then technically it'll be bankrupt. It may have to close its doors. It would collapse. And look at the thousands of people who have money in that bank who would be hurt by that. And who knows, that bank is such a big bank. If it fell, it might be the first domino, causing all the other banks to fall. And we could have a major recession or depression on our hands. And look how the people of America would suffer. And so Congress dutifully runs to the front and says, yes, yes, we don't want any of that to happen. And they vote the funds to guarantee the loans or in some cases to make outright payments to keep that river of interest payments going to the banks. Not the small banks, the big banks. Here are some of the games you may have missed. Penn Central Railroad was bailed out in 1970. Lockheed Corporation also in 1970, Commonwealth Bank of Detroit in 1972, New York City in 1975, Chrysler Corporation in 1978, First Pennsylvania Bank in 1980, Continental Illinois, the largest of the banks so far, in 1982, and all of those countries in the third world 
who can no longer make their interest payments are now making their payments because they got the money from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which got it from the Federal Reserve System, which got it from you and me through the Mandrake Mechanism. And my final topic before I reach the conclusion is one that I think you'll find interesting, and that is usury. In the old days, the biblical times, usury was defined as interest on a loan. Any interest on any loan was usury. Well, in modern times, that's been redefined to mean excessive interest on a loan. Not moderate interest, because, we, well, this is in keeping with the concept that if we work hard for our money, we save our money, we don't spend it, we sacrifice its pleasure, and we loan it to somebody for their venture, we're entitled to a reasonable return for that sacrifice. A reasonable interest seems fair and logical to most people. But what is this thing, excessive interest? Thomas Edison said, People who will not turn a shovel full of dirt on the project, nor contribute a pound of materials, will collect more money than will the people who will supply all the materials and do all the work. I wondered about that when I read it. I thought, was Tom exaggerating? So I got my calculator out and I punched in the numbers. I took, for an example, a $100,000 house to be built. I assumed the $30,000 was going to go for the land and the architect's fees and the permits, that 70000 would go for the actual construction of the house, the labor and the materials. I assumed that the buyer would go to the bank, put 20% down, take out a 30-year loan at 10% interest. I punched in the numbers and I found out that the borrower will pay to the bank in interest $172,741 as compared to $70,000 paid for those who did all the labor and did all the work. In other words, the bank will earn two and a half times as much money as those who produced. You may say, well, yes, but don't forget the time value of money. When you save money and you sacrifice its use and 30 years is a long period of time and all this, no, not this money, ladies and gentlemen. Nobody worked for this money. Nobody sacrificed. Nobody saved it. This money was created out of nothing. And I suggest that $172,741 interest on nothing is excessive. I think it's time for a new definition of the word usury. Any interest on any loan of fiat money, meaning money made out of nothing. Now, this example of a $100,000 house, I should point out to you, is a grain of sand in the Sahara. This is nothing. You have to multiply this process by every house in America, by every hotel in America, every high-rise office building in America, every jet airplane, every automobile, every factory, every warehouse full of materials, every farm building, all the farm equipment. And you are talking about a river of unearned wealth perpetually flowing into the banking cartel that is so wide that you can't even think across it in your mind. The numbers are beyond comprehension. Where is this money going? You get the mental picture that maybe it's going into a big lake someplace. There's a big dam and it's building up. All this money is accumulating and these people are getting richer and richer and richer. Wrong. It doesn't work that way. When a person has all the wealth that he can possibly want or use for the pleasures of life, what is left? Power. 
Ladies and gentlemen, they're spending this money, this river of wealth is being used to acquire power over you and me and our children. They are literally buying up the world with it. And I don't mean they're buying up the real estate and the hardware. They're buying up control over the organizations, the institutions, through which people live and act and rely on for leadership and opinion. Technically, in sociological terms, this is called a power center. These are the power centers of society, the groups through which people work. And this is where that money has been going, is to acquire control over these groups and institutions by buying up influence and control over the people who run them. And they're spending the money on that. That means that they're buying up politicians, political parties, television networks, cable networks, newspapers, magazines, publishing houses, wire services, motion picture studios, universities, labor unions, church organizations, trade associations, tax-exempt foundations, multinational corporations, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, you name it. Any group, any institution which exercises influence has been a target for control, and they have a lot of money to spend to acquire that control, especially those organizations and individuals which supposedly are in opposition to themselves. This process has been going on not only in our country and in a more or less parallel manner in the other industrialized nations of the world, but ladies and gentlemen, in the so-called third world or underdeveloped nations, it has gone on so much further than you can ever imagine. In fact, it is now complete. These countries have been purchased already with this money. Did you ever wonder what's going on there at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank? You don't hear much about that. Every once in a while, on the back page of the newspaper, you'll read that Congress authorized another hundred billion dollars to go to the IMF, to be loaned to some little country or given to them, and they explain to us that this is to raise their standard of living. Well, you don't believe that either. That is an appearance of the fourth kind. It's not going to raise their standard of living. If it is, if that's the true purpose, they're not doing a very good job of it, are they? Because, you know, if you look at those nations, after all of these decades and expenditures of hundreds of billions of dollars, you cannot point to one nation that has had its standard of living raised one iota. In fact, in most cases, it's the other way around. The reason is simple. That's not the purpose of the money. The money does not go to the people. It does not go to the businesses in those countries, which might have a chance of raising the standard of living. It goes to the politicians in those countries, to the governments. And it is used specifically to strengthen their control mechanisms over the people, to build collectivist totalitarian systems. Countries that start off as inefficient dictatorships get all the money from the United Nations and end up as efficient dictatorships. The money is used to strengthen their army and to strengthen their bureaucracies. These people, for the most part, couldn't care less about the standard of living of their subjects, so long as they live well, so long as they have their mansions and their yachts and their jet aircraft and their trips to New York, to the United Nations, and their suites at the Waldorf Astoria. Ideology means nothing to them. Socialism, communism, capitalism, fascism, what does it matter? Where is the money? This is it. And we're now dealing with second and third generation welfare families here. You know how hard it is to break a welfare family in our own country after the second and third generation. We have governments around the world that are now second and third generation welfare to the UN. There's not a chance in the world they're going to break away from that money. They wouldn't know how to operate any other way 
It's a way of life. They are addicted. And they now are in place in the new world order where they're just waiting for you and me to show up. In fact, that's the other side of this. Not only has this transfer of wealth from America to the third world not raised their standard of living, but it has indeed helped to lower ours. And that, too, was part of the plan. In many ways, they're trying just to waste money to reduce our standard of living. A strong nation is not a candidate to surrender its sovereignty, but a weak nation is. If America can be brought to her knees, if she can be hungry, if she can be filled with despair, if there can be riots in her streets and she doesn't know where to turn, then she perhaps will willingly accept totalitarian measures from a United Nations peacekeeping force, the Blue Helmets, might even be welcomed, or rescue with an international monetary unit that has purchasing power for a while. This is how it's being played out, ladies and gentlemen. And so I want to just conclude by saying that the name of the game is not wealth. It is power. So what are we going to do about this? Well, it's obvious we have to slay the creature. Obviously, that's the starting point. We can't allow this creature to continue. It has to be eliminated. But how are you going to do that? We're going to do it in Congress. Congress created the Federal Reserve System, and Congress can abolish the Fed. But we have to build some fire under the chairs of those congressmen we have to get some new faces in there. I don't care whether it's Republican or Democrat or Independent or what have you. The titles are not important. It's what they believe in, the principles. Those are the important things. But we do need an informed electorate out there. It's not going to happen unless people know about these issues. And education is our necessity. Sounds kind of boring, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just jump right into politics? But people won't know what we're talking about unless they understand the issues. We need an educational army out there, ladies and gentlemen. And it's time to enlist. As Patrick Henry would have said it, in fact, as he did say it, our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? The bad news, the really bad news, is that time is running out. We used to talk about these things. I remember not too long ago, I would talk about some of these issues and people would look at me and say, you got to be kidding. That could never happen in America. And now, when I talk about these issues, they lean forward and say, how much time do we have left? It's visible all around us. The new world order is descending around us. I mean, they're preparing a, a, a world court of justice, a world taxing authority, a world monetary unit, a world army. As we speak, over half of our standing military right now is serving under foreign officers at the UN, and the process is rapidly moving. So, ladies and gentlemen, time is running out. Whatever you plan to do for your country or for your freedom, do it now. <laughs>